Moses says this to God's people. I set before you today a choice. You know we have a choice every moment of every day. I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction, ultimately blessings and curses, and now choose. And of course he tells us what to choose. Choose life. Life is the right answer. <clears throat> we have been learning, and I know there's many here today that haven't been with us for a few weeks, but we're spending time learning from Joshua. Because Joshua chose life. Joshua was mentored by Moses. Joshua spent many uh, years with Moses and learning how to worship God, how to give his life to God. Joshua is an incredible man of God. And Joshua is the one who gets to lead God's people into this new life. To so this life that's going to be surrounded by all sorts of things that's going to try to drag those people away. And as long as Joshua was the leader of his people, of God's people, they flourished. They were blessed. Uh, they experienced peace in the time of Joshua. Because Joshua made a decision to choose life, no matter what. That is not an easy task we're discovering these last few weeks. It's easy to say, I choose life. I remember when I, Mark and I first got saved and the pastor offered us the choice. It was a no-brainer, right? I'm picking heaven over hell. But then the journey begins to walk a new life, a new creation, a whole new way. It's nothing like I've ever lived before or experienced. Having a relationship with God is like any other relationship. We try to compare it so that our finite mind can understand an infinite God. But the reality is, is that we will never be infinite like God. We're never going to be deity. We're never going to be God. And so we're not going to fully comprehend what that is. And so we have to trust his living word. That's why I impressed upon Taylor and Tesla and Nancy to raise them up to have a relationship with God's word. And lots of people read the word but don't have a relationship with the word. What do I mean by that? I mean that I read the word and I know what the word says, but I don't do what it says. It doesn't change my life. It doesn't change my thoughts. It doesn't change my behavior. In that particular case, all you've done is learn how to read his word. You haven't learned how to have a relationship with his word. And so Joshua did. Joshua understood. And so we've been spending a few weeks going, what are the different things that we can look at Joshua's life that he did that were to do? You know, last week we talked about consecration, giving our lives totally over to God. We talked about circumcision. That was a fun talk, right, for the teens? Go watch that one on YouTube. Uh, not with your kids, I'll just forewarn you. We probably should have put a warning on that one, Nick. I don't know if you, if you watched that one. Uh, we used some pretty uh, fun words. So we talked about what does this mean about giving our lives over. And that's what Joshua did before they entered into this. They said we need to be set apart for God and to give our lives over to God. Um, I want Today I want us to talk about now what is the next thing that we see. Probably one of the most powerful. I mean there's so much you can see in God's word that as we read this truth, it should hit us at our heart. And make us go, wow, that cuts me to the heart. What am I going to do with this truth? Because this isn't a history book. It's not a, well that's an interesting story. It's, it's God's story that's designed to intersect your life. God created you to be in relationship with him. This is essentially a story designed to be your story. So when you read stories about Joshua or any of the great stories in the Bible, they're not designed to wow you or entertain you or to even educate you. They're designed to transform your life. When you look into that word and it reflects back to your soul, is there anything that you go, wow, I need to fix something? That's what the word is. So when we look at this great story of the fall of Jericho, and partly the reason I showed that video is because we're going to kind of talk about those first fruits today. Because that's one of the things that he did right away. After consecration, after getting ready to enter into this promised land, as the video explained to you, that Jericho is the first city they conquer. And so they totally destroy. They don't go through and destroy every city that they take. They don't tear down every single thing in every city, but they do come in and take over and do those type of things. But this particular city is the first to be conquered. And by faith, they had to believe that God would continue to conquer and that they would get the land as God promised.
promise. This will become your land. This is where you will reside, and I will be your God, and you will be my people. I'm coming in to take over a land that currently has people that don't follow me, that don't have a relationship with me, and you are going to occupy that land. So by faith, they had to do this. So the first fruits. Let me just tell you the story. I'll kind of read. I think I put the verse up if you're ever curious about the walls of Jericho. And you probably, many of you may even know this story. It's an interesting story about how God took the city of Jericho with Joshua. And with Joshua, <clears throat> remember, I might have mentioned this last week. One of the interesting things I love is in 5.13 it says, When Joshua was near the city of Jericho, he looked up and he saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua goes up to him and he says, are you for us or for our enemies? And I absolutely love, because a lot of times as Christians, we get very superior. We almost deify ourselves as if somehow we're God. Make no mistake about it. I don't care how holy or good a Christian you are. You are not God. Ever. That doesn't happen. He remains God, and we remain his followers. So I love the response that this, this angel, really, this man says, neither. Neither. But as a commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. So he says, I come in the name of God. I do not come in the name of First Nazarene. I do not come in the name of Pastor Renee. I do not come in the name of powerful Joshua. Joshua is not capable of taking Jericho down. God and God alone is. In the name of God, that's who I'm for. So I love that he says that to Joshua of all people. <laughs> and of course, Joshua, if you're reading along, you see that Joshua literally falls face down. Some of us feel awkward to come to pray at the altar. When you're in the presence of the living God, I'm going to tell you something. Let me give you a little foreshadowing of what it's going to be like when you stand before God. You will probably crumble in his presence. And I will tell you this. You won't look around to see who's watching. You won't. You will not care about anything but the majesty and the magnificence of God Almighty. It will overwhelm you. And you will not care about anything else. Joshua fell face down, and he says, what is the word the Lord has for me? So the commander of the Lord replies to tell him, take off your sandals. The place where you are standing is holy. You are in the presence of an angel of the Lord, and I am bringing his word. And when his word is spoken, that is holy ground, because God is there. Where God is, it is holy. <clears throat> he says, now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. See, at this point, people had heard of the Israelites. It would be wonderful if we lived in a community, if we lived in a world where people had heard of Christians the way they're supposed to. And not what they do here. But it says that they had heard of the Israelites, and so they had securely barred up Jericho. <clears throat> this is a very prosperous. I also want you to know, just it'll, it'll make more sense later, but at the time that God is having them go in, it would have actually had the harvest had already come in, and their, their grains would have been full. The city would have been packed with lots of good stuff for them to have. So God says, so the man says, the gates of Jericho were securely barred. No one went out, no one came in. Then the Lord says to Joshua, see, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. Well, there you go. Go home. Done. He says, I've already done it. I've already, I've already won before I've even done anything. I have already conquered what I'm asking you to do. Do you know that when God asks you to do something, can I tell you something? He's not going, I hope it works. Let's see what happens. Could you imagine, right? If it's like, go ahead, I want you to do this. I want you to give this amount. Then you give it. He goes, I oh, hope that was the right amount. What? What do you mean you hope that was the right amount? Well, I don't know. Let's see what happens. I don't know. Let's see what happens. God already knows what's going to happen. That's why he's telling you to do it. You need not fear of the outcome. He's already done it. And you can walk in obedience standing on that foundation. It's okay. God's already done it. So then he goes on to say, and this is the 
part that we teach in children's church, they, and there's little games that we do to teach this story. Pastor Norma probably remembers those days. March around the city once. Now listen very carefully. These are very specific rules. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Okay. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up and everyone straight in. I don't know about you, but I would be like, hold down, slow down, professor, go over that one more time. There was a lot of numbers in there. All right, how many times do I got to go around? What is it? Is it seven times, six times? I don't remember. Write it down again. Right? This is very specific. Coming from a God who in the past, when they crossed the Red Sea, they didn't have to do no dance. They didn't have to do it's just like touch the water. Boom, there it goes. They crossed the Jordan River. Oftentimes they went into battle. As long as they got out of the tent and they went out into battle, then God won it. But in this particular case, we see that he's giving them very specific orders. We kind of look at that. So then Joshua calls the priests and says to them, take the ark, and he begins to tell them exactly what they need to do. Exactly what I just said. He gets up early the next morning, and the priest took up the ark. The seven priests carrying the seven trumpets went forward, marching before the ark of the Lord, blowing the trumpets. They did exactly what the Lord told them to do. On the seventh day, they got up at daybreak, marched around the city seven times in the same manner, except that on that day, they circled the city seven times. The seventh time around, when the priest sounded the trumpet blast, remember, a long blast, then Joshua commanded the army, shout! That's the fun part of children's church. <laughs> you guys are not fun. <laughs> Thank you, James. Appreciate that. Anyway, we'll do this in children's church. We'll have fun. Right? Maybe next week we can have a good day. For the Lord has given you this city. The city and all the in it are, be, are to be devoted to the Lord and given to the Lord only. And then it talks about Rahab, who was a prostitute and, and sparing her. Then it goes on and says, keep away from the devoted things so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. The video gave you a little preview that somebody's, there's always somebody in the camp. There's always somebody in the church. You know, it's like, don't blow it, right? There's always one person. But you're going to find out about that in a couple weeks. Otherwise, you may make the camp of Israel able to destruction and bring trouble on it. When you do not obey, it isn't just about you. You know that the family of God is affected. And not just the family of God, but the world around us are affected. Do you know that the world that we live in today is affected by Christianity's disobedience to God? It's heartbreaking, really. I was praying in my office this morning, looking over the apartments and just praying for them. I really felt prompted to pray, Lord, help the church be true to who we are. So that that neighborhood could be changed. That would be awesome. It says, uh, all the silver and the gold and the articles of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord and must go into the treasury of the Lord. We keep none for ourselves. So the two lessons that we learn from that, and there's other things we can read on and we will in a couple weeks about what happens and they don't do exactly what they're supposed to do. But we do know that it works, and they go in, and they take over the city, and everything is destroyed, in including all living beings. The two lessons that we learned from the fall of Jericho, the first one is give to God first. Seems so easy. You know, we all love Matthew 6.33, right? Uh, Seek first his kingdom and all his righteousness, and everything will be added unto you. We know that verse by heart, but few of us live it. We don't understand why we're struggling, why we don't have these extras. You know, it's kind of like the video of, of Cain. You know, Cain waited until he had enough, then he gave. That is a principle that most Christians live by today. As long as my storehouse is stored up, then I will give. And we're not just talking about finances, but it, it's not that we're not talking about finances. Sometimes people hear that and go, shoot, good, don't talk about money. Talk about something else. Okay, God talks about money. If it makes you uncomfortable, that's why Jesus said you can't serve God with money, because money is very powerful. If you're cringing right now because I'm talking about money, let me give you a hint. 
it's, it's a struggle for you. If you're like, I don't care, I don't got any anyways, right? This is not a struggle for you. Uh, but give to God first everything. You know, I, it's interesting. I did not plan this message for today, for the dedication that Nancy did today. But it's interesting how the dedication of those two girls fits with the message of today. To give to God everything. Jericho was the first fruit. Do everything unto God means when we give Him our children. When you give Him your day, right? What does that mean? What does that mean to give them? We essentially are saying it is yours, God, and you say how I'm going to use or live with or interact. If I say I'm going to give this relationship to you, right, a lot of us, you know, we compartmentalize our Christianity. We compartmentalize our spirituality. Oh, in some areas, you are just rocking it spiritually. And you're like... Don't see me tomorrow night. But right now, I'm knocking this out of the park. Right? It's like in this particular area, I do really well. But in this area, yeah, probably I wouldn't look like a Christian in this area or in this area. You know, we compartmentalize. But it's just like with Nancy this morning, when she's giving Taylor and Tesla, you understand what she's saying is, God, these girls are yours. You need to tell me. What to do with them? How to raise them? How to show them who you are? Let me give you a hint, parents. If you don't know who they, who he is, if you don't have a relationship with the word, you are not going to be able to teach that or impress that upon your children. It's you might you're probably teaching them all sorts of wonderful things. You might say, I teach them good manners. I teach them how to wipe their mouth. I teach them how not to burp, how not to fart in public. It's wonderful. But you're not teaching them the truths of God's word. I remember Mark and I, we, were, we used to go to Horizon. There was this little girl, and some of you probably know she doesn't have to say her name. But anyway, so she came over. She was a friend of Melissa's. We were sitting at the table, and she just lets out this belch. And I was like, excuse you. She goes, oh, at my house, we don't have to say that. I go, yeah, at mine we do. So go ahead and say, excuse me. And next time, cover your mouth. Right? So it, some of us, you know, we don't, we teach our kids manners and we teach our kids how to study. We teach our kids how to be successful. We can teach our kids lots of things. But do we teach them how to have a relationship with God? <clears throat> and if you don't, you're probably going to struggle in teaching them to. But we give God everything. It's yours. You guys, if you're going to give every part of yourself, you know, in discipleship, I meet with a couple ladies each week. We were talking about love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Why the three, right? Well, because some of us say, I, I just feel love towards God. I know. And feelings just are so nice, aren't they? No. Um, but fleeting, nonetheless. Because there's going to kind of, kind of time when you are not going to feel like loving God. Or feel like loving another. So it's not just about feeling. It's about knowing. It's about the deepest part of you, I love God. With all of my being, every part of my being, I love the Lord. So that means your thoughts. That means your relationships. That means your time. That means, you know, a lot of us, hey, can you do something? Well, hold on. When, I, when there's enough time, then I will give. You know, rarely do we think to give to God first. God is always an afterthought. It's sad. We tend to give God our leftovers. The reality is, is more of us are like Cain than we are Abel. Cain always, Cain always waited until he had enough. And then Cain's like, there you go, I'm giving. And some of you would say, does it matter? Of course it matters. Right? A lot of us, we wait until, you know, which is great to get candy, not just this candy, but I've gotten an abundance of candy, which is wonderful. You know, and but at the same time, can I tell you something? In the church, do you know we would never have to do this if everybody gave the way Abel gave? There would never be a love offering. We would never have to worry about taking offerings for our missionaries, for the community, for this and for that. If every person who called themselves a Christ follower in America did was obedient in first fruits financially. I'm not even getting to the place of other things. Just financially. Do you know 
that if just in America, you would end poverty in the world. Think about it. And I think a lot of us kind of have the mentality that's like, well, what's my $10 going to do? If I only get $100 a month and I give 10, what's it going to do? Well, it'd be a start. You'd be surprised what $10 could do. Especially if three or four of you got that concept. Five, six, seven. Imagine if everybody in the church, just in this church alone, if every single person, from the child who gets an allowance, to the retired person who gets Social Security and everybody in between, we would not have to do this. We would not have to take special offerings. We would be able to care for our family and for our community. Believe it or not, we would. It's how God designed it to be. But unfortunately, we tend to give God our leftovers. And some would say, well, what's it matter if in the end you still get the candy? Because you're giving on your terms, not God's. And then you wonder why you're not being blessed. You wonder why our church isn't being blessed. You wonder why our community is still suffering. You wonder why our world is still in uproar and conflict and we can't even trust a single thing that's on the news or the media. We live in the most corrupt world. It's because everything is on my terms. Your terms, your terms, your terms, your terms. And guess what? We may like each other, but I guarantee we don't get along or on every little thing. I bet you there's some conflict there. Why do you think there's conflict in the world? But we tend to give God our leftovers. You know, why do we need to give God our time, talent, treasures? What was the point of first fruits? Does God need your money? I love when people say that. Does God need my money? God isn't having financial difficulty. No. No. He's probably the smartest financial advisor out there. So no, God does not need your money. Does God need your time? No. He himself does not need your time. In the same way that God didn't, God doesn't experience exhaustion, so why on the seventh day did he rest? He did it as a model for you and I, to practice that for you and I. He set the example for you and I. He implemented rest. So if God doesn't need it, that doesn't mean God doesn't use it. Do you know that if you look up... Uh, what first fruits is. In fact, I think I put the first up. Yeah. So if you ever want to spend time reading that, that talks about the first fruits and the tithes in Deuteronomy. It says, when you have entered the land the Lord is giving you, the one we've been talking about it, take some of the first fruits of all the produce from the soil of the land and give it and put them in a basket. Then go to the place the Lord your God has chosen for a dwelling for his name. Offer it to the priest there. It goes on some more. It says, so the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand, outstretched arm. In other words, God saved you. And with great terror and signs and wonders, he brought us out of Egypt. He brought us to this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now I bring to the church the first fruits of the soil that the Lord has given me. Then you and the Levites, the Levites, you guys, were the tribe that tended to the church. They were the priesthood. They, they were the ones who made sure that the tabernacle moved with them. They were the ones that made sure that everything stayed sacred to the Lord so that God would continue to dwell with them. The Levites had a very important job, and their job was to tend to the temple of God in every aspect of it. And if the Levites failed at that, then all of Israel suffered because then God would not dwell with them. And without God, they will perish. So the Levites had a very important job. So part of the first fruits is to provide for the Levites. They, they didn't work the land and the cattle and things like that to raise money. They depended upon the faithfulness of the other Israelites to bring in their first fruits. Not only the Levites, but it also talks about the foreigners living among you. It talks about the fatherless and the widow. That there would be enough. When you have finished setting aside a tenth of all of your produce in the third year, the year of the tithe. And some of you go, man, I'd love it if we only had to tithe every three years. You would hate it. Because remember, let's go back to that $100 illustration. You get $100 a week with $10 in the offering. And that's difficult. Sure, if you want to wait three years... Somebody could do that math right quick. I bet you're missing that Sunday. 
<laughs> oh, that's, was that the Sunday of the Tithe? Catch me in three more years. <laughs> oh, that's fine. That's fine. Wait three more years. So now we're going to add a bunch out there and then we're going to add So you sure you want to go to the three-year system? That's fine. It's a tithe nonetheless. When the harvest came in, the harvest wasn't for the week. The harvest was for the season, for them to provide. So whatever they got for the harvest, that's what they gave. But first. So be careful when you wish for a, just a, every three years. We could do that. That would be fun. As long as you promise to honor it. But generally you won't. So it says, you shall give it to the Levite, the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow, so that they may eat in your towns and be satisfied. Again, you guys, why do we give? What do the first fruits do? The first fruits not only provide for the temple, not only provide for the, the pastor and the staff and the different things it cost, cost to run the temple. Absolutely. This carpet doesn't vacuum itself. Thank you, Nick, yesterday for vacuuming. <laughs> it does, you know, all those kinds of things doesn't just happen. So we have to care for the temple and take care of these things. But also, it's for the foreigner. It's for the people who don't belong into this community. We give so that, so that we can bless others. Could you imagine a world where people talked about how generous Christians are? Mm. Mm. I don't know about you, but what I tend to hear is Christians are judgmental, condemning, critical, mean. I've heard people say in their workplace that the Christians are some of the most unhappiest people in their workplace. Pay to give a testimony. Because <laughs> you know, as a Christian, you wear the name of God, of Jesus Christ. Could you imagine a place where they're like, that is the most generous group of people. When there's a need in our community, we know we can go to the church. Oftentimes, people are way more generous outside the church than they are in the church. And it's sad. There's a reason that we are not experiencing God's abundance that his word talks about so often. I hear people say, Pastor, how come we don't see all the miracles and all the different things and all the healings and all of these wonderful things that are happening? It's easy. We're hoarding. I'll give the church time when I have time. I will give God my day after I've done everything I need to do today. I will give God some money when I have enough. There's never enough. There's never enough. If we didn't have people like Aaron and Heather and Garrett and Eva and Julie, and I've probably missed other people, that donate their time to teach kids like Taylor and Tesla and all the children over there right now, are you going to do it? To care for the little babies, so some of you can sit in here without being distracted, do some worship. Right? If Karen and Missy and Jamie and Amber and all the different people that volunteered in the nursery, we wonder why we don't see God's abundance in everyday life. It's because we're giving to God when we want to give. On our terms, not His. It's sad. It's really sad. The next thing that we learn is obeying God. Because here's one of the, the, the two lessons are give to God first and then obey God. If you click maybe two more slides, it should come up. And here's the thing. See, we want to do like, I will give when I have to give. So you want to give on your terms. You don't want to do it the way God says. And thus, like I said, imagine if everybody did it God's way, the world, we could end poverty. That's crazy. But obeying God is the second lesson. I mean, remember that whole thing of seven times, six times you're going to walk around, this time you're going to do this, and the trumpets, and make sure the priests are here and the Ark of the Covenant is here. I mean, it's like, if I was Joshua, I'd be like, oh my gosh, I'm going to mess this up. If I mess this up. And I can promise you this, if they left off one of the things, you guys, they'd have just looked like fools. They would have sounded the trumpet and be like, shoot! Joshua, we look stupid. Not only.
Hollywood, would they look stupid. But they've just announced their presence, and their army's now going to take the wall, and they're going to die. Well, what's the big deal? Why don't we just go there and shout? Why don't we just do this? Because the Lord said to do it this way. But we want to question God. God desires obedience. And I put this verse up for you to read as well. Um, 1 Samuel 15. This is where King Saul was king. And God told him, go in and take over this land. And devour everything. Save nothing. But instead, I'm just giving you the paraphrased version. He allowed his army to take some of the plunder. Some of the stuff with them. He even kept the king alive. And he kept another thing. And he said, okay, here we go. And Saul did that because the people wanted to do that. And Saul even says later, when Samuel confronts him, who's a prophet, he even says, the soldiers made me do it. I would have obeyed God, but they didn't want to. And then, but before that, Saul actually says, we sacrificed we made great sacrifices. We had this money. We got all this stuff. And so we had this great sacrifice to God. And his answer is to the Lord does not delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as much as in what? Obey the Lord. To obey is better than sacrifice. And some of you, it's like, what's it matter? Aren't you tired of living in conflict? Aren't you tired of of all the turmoil that goes on in your life? At what point are you going to start to figure out that you not obeying God is the problem? And it's not the soldiers in your life. It's not the friends in your life. It's not the family. It's not your mom and dad because they dropped you on your head or whatever they did growing up. It isn't everybody else's fault. You are an adult. Make a decision. To follow or obey. We always, see, we want to try and figure out why God wants us to do X, Y, and Z. And then we figure we can get to the same end. It's just like, it's just like giving you guys. I saw this thing, I don't know where I saw it. Maybe it was on Facebook or something. It was a news thing. And I guess this fam, this guy canceled his wedding. And um, so the dinner that he planned, the uh, food, he ended up feeding all these homeless people. It's like, that's awesome. That is great. And I think it's great. I'm not here to put that down. I'm not here to put down that we do things like that. But we, we bring those things to, and I, I'm not, I have no idea who this man is. I don't know anything about this story. So don't get me wrong. I'm not judging the story. I think that's wonderful. It's great that he didn't let the food go to waste and he fed it. We do stuff like that all the time. I think it's wonderful to do that. But we're doing that in lieu of obeying God. I'm not saying he is. I don't know him. But what I'm saying is, we go, what's it matter if eventually I help somebody? It matters because you're not obeying. You're not obeying. You know, you guys, our end game, see, we try to figure out what he's wanting us to do. That's why some of you, it's like, God doesn't want you to watch certain things on TV. And you go, it's okay. I know God thinks that it's going to make it, so he wants my heart to stay pure, but I, I read my Bible every day, and it's okay. I understand what he, why he's doing that. It's like I said last week. It's like the teenager that tells his parent, I know, I know, you don't want me to go out past 10 o'clock because you're worried about me. Don't worry about it. I'm going to be really safe. We have a designated driver planned. You know, I've, I've packed some condoms. We're going to be great. I would be really responsible in my irresponsible behavior. What? Well, I, that's what you're really worried about, right? You're worried that something's going to happen to me. Well, I'm telling you, it's not. I've got it under control. And we do the same thing with God. God says, I don't want you to do certain things. I, don't, I want you to do certain things. I want you to do this, and I want you to do that. And you go, okay, okay, I understand. You want me to have a relationship with the Word so that all love people. I don't need to be in my Bible all the time. I don't need to be going to church. I don't need to have other Christian friends. I don't need to do all those things. I get it. I get it. I get it, God. You want me to be loving to other people. I got it. I don't need to do it your way. I've come up with a much easier way. 
And it's great because it's my way. And God's like, what, you want credit for that? You're not going to get credit for that. You're not going to get credit for that. Cain didn't get credit for his. You're not going to get credit for yours. I don't care how loving you, how well you think you're doing at being the things of God. If you're not doing it his way, wrong. <laughs> right? Some of you were quite a bit older, but you remember taking the driving test? Yeah, how many of you got an automatic fail? You had to go back. Right? Anybody? There we go. It's okay to be honest. There you go. Yeah, first time. Right? You get in the car and then you just do a rolling stop. Take the car back. It's automatic fail. What? What do you mean I failed? That's an automatic fail. Teenagers, listen up. You roll through a stop. That's an automatic fail. You're back at the DMV. And if you tell the DMV instructor, it's okay. I looked. There was no cars coming. Oh, well, good. Don't worry about it. Let's just keep going. Now I know you looked. It's okay. I'm going to give you an A. I can see how responsible you are breaking the law. Just obey. Let me help you understand what our end game is, you guys. Stop trying to figure God out. Do you remember what I said a few minutes ago? He got this big of a brain. Trying to understand a brain as big as this room. <laughs> not going to happen. You are not God, nor will you ever be God. Don't try to figure it out. Just obey. Your end game is obedience. Boom. There. You did it. You can feel good about obeying. Don't worry about the income. God, uh, the outcome. Some of you are like, oh, God, well, I'm being the wife that you're calling to be. My husband's still a jerk. <laughs> is that why you were doing what I told you to do? Yes. He's really a jerk. <laughs> So your end game, wife, is for your husband not to be a jerk. Yes, I think I've made that clear. He's really, really bad. And God's like, I need you to obey. That needs to be your end game, period. What happens after that is for God to do, and we experience those blessings. Do exactly what he says. Let God worry about the why and the how. I don't know if I put up 646, but uh, as Josh comes up, let's just kind of look at this verse and get ready to uh, be prepared to, to make a decision, essentially, the choice between life and death. But we must let, you know, Luke 646, I just want to say, what is this verse from? I love this. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? This, this should be on Christian's bumper stickers. <laughs> Not John 3.16. I'm sorry. And here's and let me let me give the Christians just a little break here. It's easy. You know why you're breaking it? It's because you don't know what he says. That's fine. You can try the whole ignorance route when you're standing before God. I don't recommend it. I don't recommend it since he's made it more than available, especially in America to his word, for you to stand before God and be a Christian in America and say, I didn't know, <laughs> after God picks himself off the ground from laughing and says, you've got to be kidding me. You act like you were from some tribe far off in the you know what and ain't nobody ever come talk to you. Again, I don't recommend ignorance. But it's your choice, not mine. But that verse that Jesus is talking about, why do you call me Lord, Lord? He says, I'm going to tell you the one who puts, who hears my word and puts them into practice. It's the person who took and built a house on foundation. He dug really deep and laid this deep foundation. And the Bible is clear. It says, when the storm came, when the storm came, not if, when, when the storm comes, the house was able to stand. Yeah, some windows got blown out, some shingles probably came off, but that house stood because it was built on a strong foundation. He says, do you know want to know what's going to happen to the person who does not do what I say? They're the person who built their house without a foundation. So that when the storm came, there was no foundation. 
Obedience is the foundation of God. Do you know the more that you obey and the more you're in a relationship with his word, I will tell you something. You'll begin to see why God wants you to do what he wants you to do. That doesn't mean you take over being God. But you begin to see how clearly things will be if we would only obey. If we would only obey. But the foundation has to be built first. And the foundation is just like you kids, the, you moms that have little kids. Do you explain, I can ask Kristen, do you explain to Gavin why he can't stick his finger in an outlet? Or, by the way, pop his eyeball out and show it to Pastor Renee. So two people right there. Can't help it. Anyway, do, you, do we explain those? When Kayla and Alyssa were little, they stuck their finger in the socket. They only did it once, each of them. Uh, only once. Because my husband went over and whacked their hand so hard. Do you think he sat down and talked about electricity with them? Now Alyssa and Kayla. You know, when you touch that, the surge of stuff is going to happen. And this little thing could come in. And then it's going to go through your body. It could kill you. She's 18 months old. You know why she never touched it again? Because <laughs> he hit his hand. Because he hit her hand. And so this is what Kayla said. Yeah, I'm not supposed to touch that. <laughs> that is a very bad thing. <laughs> I don't know why, but for whatever reason, my parents freak out when I go by that thing. <laughs> and I need to obey that. As you develop a relationship with God, you will begin to understand why you're supposed to do what you're supposed to do. So it's before you. The choice between life and death, every Sunday we're going to offer that choice to you. In choosing life, we need to at every moment give to God. Give him our thoughts, our behaviors, abilities, time, and treasure. Then you ask him, what should I do with this? So as we close here, and I'm going to pray for you, I want you to really think about that. Is there an area of your life that you keep keeping from God? Maybe you do fine with it. It doesn't matter. You, money has no bind on you. But maybe it's your time. Maybe it's another behavior. Maybe it's a habit. Maybe it's a thought. Maybe it's whatever it is. We give everything to God, and then we say, God, what do you want me to do with this? I've given you my life. Now tell me what you want me to do. And stop questioning God. Just obey. That needs to be your end game. Stop trying to figure out what his end game is. You'll never be able to do it. You'll never be able to do it. Develop a relationship with God now. Let me pray for you. Father God, I thank you, Lord, that you've uh, given us a choice. That we can actually choose life or death. That we can choose, Lord curses or blessings, that we can choose prosperity or destruction. Lord, we know that those choices seem so easy, but we also know that the choice of life is not easy. I understand more than ever, God, why your word says that narrow is the path to choosing life, but wide is the road that chooses destruction wide road is so much easier. On the wide road, God, we get to do things our way. And we get to continue to be our own God on that path, Lord. And I've been my own God for so long, it's just natural. Lord, this new journey of walking with you, of choosing life, choosing your blessings, it's, it's narrow. It's very specific, much as it was for Israel with Jericho. You have very specific rules for them. But, oh, God, in the end, we see, we see the reward. We also see the curses, Lord. We see the blessings. And we see the destruction. And we see the prosperity, Lord, what it looks like to walk with you and to walk against you. Lord, I pray for everyone here today, God. You'd speak to each one of us, for we're all, Lord, on this journey towards you. And you're speaking to each one of us on the journey. Lord, I pray right now that we would obey. Whatever it is you're prompting in our heart, whatever it is you're speaking to us about, may we obey. It is absolutely the only way to your truth, to your blessings, to your life, to your abundance. Lord, may our end game be to completely obey you and you alone. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you, that you for your word. It continues to speak that life to us, to encourage us on the journey. We praise you.
say these things in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh -oh.